Excited to share their life on the water with friends, Chad and Abby entertained guests. They took friends out cruising on the river, though they had little actual experience in sailing. Even on a clear day, an hour of sailing into the wind left them red in the face, deaf in both ears, and blind and itchy in both eyes. And cold. And not talking to each other. They learned what lines not to hold on to at certain times by always grabbing the wrong ones. The wind ripped lines from their hands, leaving them rope-burnt and bleeding. They took their friends out for sailing trips only to find that the wind wasn't blowing. On the rare occasion that there was wind, and they thought it was a good day to die, they raised a sail or two. If friends were with them on those days, then going sailing became a lot like shouting incomprehensible instructions in a foreign language while floating helplessly downstream. Lines got caught or wound up. Sails sank into the water. The engine flooded, and they drifted among other boats and barges until the pistons dried out. Does sailing always go like this? was a question asked more than once on the Arctic Loon. Abby's routine answer was yes, but only when you are sailing with us. After a few months, Chad and Abby were alone with each other, having run out of friends with whom to share their increasingly dubious adventure. It might have been a romantic existence if both of them thrived on challenges and loved living on the river, with no friends and no money, but hours to spend making sense of all the lines incessantly wound into a quagmire of knots. Not to mention the hundred other things wrong with the boat and the challenge of sleeping with all the violent rocking and jostling and banging of hundreds of lines against hundreds of masts outside the main cabin. And the bugs, and the moist, moldy environment, and allergies. Halfway through their second summer on the water, Abby slowly backed away from sailing. She stopped handling ropes and lines, even when Chad was scrambling to handle four or five of them at once. And she gravitated back toward land in subtle ways. Usually, the two of them used the showers that had recently been installed on the dock, while they ran their laundry in the small coin-op laundry room, separating the men's showers from the women's. The showers were only fifty or so steps away from the boat. But Abby started showering up on land, where the marina had another facility next to a workout room. It took five minutes to get there. She shrugged her shoulders when Chad asked why she'd started preferring that one. Her new habit of shrugging her shoulders communicated more than either of them were willing to say out loud. In the fall, after his divorce from Abby, Chad started college. His money had mostly been sunk into the sailboat, but there was just enough left to salvage something out of the wreck of his life. He got into student housing at a state university and waited for student loans to kick in. He studied literature and folklore and history and writing. He talked with professors after class. He roamed far and wide in academic research. He thought maybe he could learn to write his way out of his loss and confusion and loneliness. But before and after class, he had little to say to fellow students. He learned and remembered the first names of only four other students in four years. He sat alone every night at the McMinimans one block from campus and drank the coffee a friendly bartender spiked for him. He lived from quarter to quarter on student loans. He had trouble formulating plans for the future. Four years later, in June of 2001, several officious-looking robed men whom he had never met handed him a diploma and shook his hand. He found himself unemployed and about to lose his dorm room. He was no longer a student. He was no longer anyone's husband. The four people whose names he knew moved away. He found Portland-area docks to sit on, sometimes fishing, sometimes taking on odd jobs, like washing and waxing boats, cleaning storage closets at marinas, or rewiring the lights at the top of someone's mast. 
He dropped resumes off at a dozen marinas up and down the Columbia, earned what he could through the fall, and paid his old roommate to keep a space for him in the dorm room. Just before campus emptied for the Thanksgiving holiday, he got a call from a marina on the Multnomah Channel. He'd gotten a job, a full-time job at Rock Creek Marina, about half an hour northwest of the Portland metro area, by car. He'd work in the floating office fuel dock as an assistant to the marina's manager, Rick. All he needed was to find somewhere close to the marina to live. <laughs> 